It's with us and wanting the government to leave them alone. You've got taxpayers. Stop messing with my paycheck. Property owners, please respect my property rights. Homeschoolers, people who wish to make the sacrifice to educate their own kids, they simply wish to be left alone. They don't go knock on your door and tell you to homeschool. They simply wish to be left alone to do so themselves. I serve on the board of directors of the National Rifle Association. They seat us alphabetically. I get to sit next to Ted Nugent. It's fun. Those who care about the Second Amendment, right, we just wish to be left alone. We don't insist that every fourth grade child in America in public school be taught books entitled Heather Has Two Hunters. We just wish to be left alone. And so around the table, businessmen and women, people who just want to be left alone to raise their own family and, ra and make their own small business flourish to, to progress, in their progress in their profession, people who wish to be left alone in their economic lives, and all the communities of faith for people for whom the most important thing in their life is to have religious liberty so they can practice their faith and transmit it to their children. Now we go around our table and the reason why we can work together is that nobody wants anything on a vote moving issue at the expense of anyone else. Because the guy who wants to make money all day may look across the table at the guy who wants to go to church all day and say, not how I spend my time. And they both look over at the guy who wants to fondle his guns all day and they say that's not what we do with our freedom. It's not necessary that we all agree what we do with our freedom. What's necessary is that we agree that we are a community that insists on being free. Now that's, that's our team. And I got a call from New York press guy when Hillary Clinton was running for president. And Hillary had given a speech up in New York and said what the left needs is one of those meetings like Grover runs in Washington. Because we put 150 center-right activists together every Wednesday for an hour and a half. You talk for three minutes about what you're doing, not what you're feeling, not what other people should be doing, but what you're doing to advance liberty. And Hillary said, we, we progressives, they drove liberal into the dirt, so they switched over. It's the same thing. We progressives, she said, need one of those meetings. And the press guy asked, what do you think? And I said, well, imagine who sits around Hillary Clinton's table recently stolen by Barack Obama. Okay, around the left's table, the trial lawyers, the big labor union bosses, the big city political machines, the two wings of the dependency movement, people who are locked into welfare dependency, and people who make $90,000 a year, making sure none of those people get a job, get off welfare, and become Republicans. Yeah. Then we have all the coercive utopians sitting around the takings co coalition table. We're the Leave Us Alone coalition. They're the takings coalition. They view the proper role of government as taking things from other people and giving it to somebody else, usually money, and oddly enough, usually them. So as we go further around the Takings Coalition table, we have those guys who want to mandate cars too small to put your entire family into. Who came up and mandate those toilets that don't flush completely. The people who decided that on the Sabbath you have to separate the green glass from the brown glass from the white glass for the recycling priests. And then they've got a list of things that you have to do and that you're not allowed to do. It is slightly longer and more tedious than Leviticus. It goes on and on and on. So around the left's table, and they want to enforce it, guys. This isn't advice from them. They want the government to make you do these things. So around the table, the left can get along as long as we're stupid enough to keep throwing taxpayer money in the center of that table. That's what the stimulus was out of, all about. $800 billion thrown into the middle of the table and all our friends on the left can get along and get and work together. Why? 
because it's like the, the scene in the movie after the bank robbery. One for you, one for you, one for you, and they're all smiling. But if we do our job right, if we work hard in defense of liberty, if we say no new taxes and mean it and hold that line, then as the pile of money begins to dwindle in the center of the left's table, they all begin to look at each other a little bit more like the second of the last movie, second of the last scene in those movies about lifeboats. Now they're beginning to wonder who they're going to eat or who they're going to throw overboard. So our job is not to raise taxes and not to put more money out to hire more Democratic precinct workers with. This is why the other team's interest in life is always raising taxes. The left on taxes is like a teenage boy on a prom date. They keep asking for the same thing again and again and again, just different ways. Our job is to say no, no, no. It doesn't do any good at all to say no, no, yes. Okay? Defeats the whole purpose, whether the prom date or the tax issue. So we've got to be consistent and make it work. That's why Americans for Tax the Group Reform, the group that I chair, we share the no tax increase pledge. It's a pledge to the American people. 219 members of the House, a majority of the members of the U.S. House, including Congresswoman Bachman, who just spoke, have signed that pledge and kept it and have voted against all efforts to raise taxes. And that frustrates the left tremendously. And the reason we put the pledge forward is to make it easy for voters to know who stands with them and who stands against them. And, the, and we don't get any government reform until you take tax increases off the table permanently. Tax increases are what politicians do instead of governing, instead of reforming, instead of making priorities. Instead of fixing past mistakes, they raise taxes so they don't have to make any of those decisions. If we don't let them raise taxes, we begin to enter the conversation of reforming government. Now, one of the advantages of the no tax increase pledge is that we have ivory soap percentages of Republicans at the national level who've made that commitment in writing to their citizens, to their voters, not to raise taxes. And it's branded the modern Republican Party at a national level as the party that won't raise taxes. May do a number of other silly things, but it won't raise taxes. This has been helpful because branding matters. Coca-Cola spends a lot of time on quality control and branding so that you can go into the grocery store, pick up a Coke bottle, take it home. You don't have to read the label. You don't have to ask the proprietor what's in it. You don't have to get a taste. You know what's in it. You take it home. But if you get home with your Coke bottle and you go two-thirds of the way through it and you look down and there is a rat head in what's left in your Coke bottle, you do not say to yourself, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether I'm going to finish all the rest of this Coke bottle this evening. You, in fact, go on the local TV show and show them the cool rat head and you tweet the picture out and the whole world knows and it is a big problem for Coca-Cola because it damages the brand for everybody else. Republican elected officials who for any excuse at all vote for a tax increase are rat heads in a Coke bottle. They damage the brand for everyone else. It's not a victimless crime. It affects all of us. Now, there are three lies that Obama and the other team have been putting forward to try and sell us on tax increases. First one is, oh, I'm only going to tax a few of you. Maybe just like the rich people over here, okay? So the rest of you go do something else. This won't affect you. This is the Richard Speck theory of tax increases. That if you can't take on everyone in the room, you take them out of the room one at a time. Okay? Those of you who are younger, ask somebody else who Richard Speck was. But we know from history 
that when the politicians say we're only going to tax the rich, they haven't finished the sentence. We're only going to tax the rich to start. The personal income tax was only supposed to hit top rate 7% when they put it in 100 years ago. Happy birthday, everybody. 100 years ago, 1913, personal income tax, you had to make $11.5 million a year in today's dollars to get hit with, hold your breath, 7%. That was the tax on rich people. Not so big today. 10% is the opening bid, and half the country's paying the income tax. So they promised it hit the few, hits, all, hits a majority now. Then there was the Spanish-American War Tax. You remember that. Okay, when Spain so viciously attacked us, we had to defend ourselves. Anyway, Spanish-American War Tax, it was a tax on rich people, 1898, who had phones and made long-distance calls. Only phones were 5,000 bucks a piece at the time. Pretty shortly, everybody had phones and everybody was making calls. And for a hundred years, we were paying this, everybody with a phone was paying this tax, this temporary tax for a specific purpose, only rich people. And for a hundred years, everybody was paying it. Now I went to public school, but I was watching the History Channel recently and realized that that Spanish-American War thing has been over for a while. <laughs> then we get the other lie. Oh no, this is going to be a replacement for the other tax, right? We'll raise your income tax and temporarily reduce your property taxes. Or we'll raise the sales taxes and reduce the property taxes temporarily. Or the new one, we're going to have a carbon tax and we promise to reduce the income tax. Here's the problem. The idea that because you have one tax and you add another, that somehow they're going to come to become smaller. If you have a tapeworm and you swallow a second tapeworm, on the tapeworm's promise that they will both behave better, this is not the way to bet. Chances are that tapeworms, like taxes, will grow as rapidly as they can and having two is twice as bad as one. Watch for that carbon tax. They keep bringing it back. The teenage boy on prom date I talked about. The, the land shark from Saturday Night Live. They keep coming back. Carbon tax. It's, carbon tax is a vat in a green uniform. The European value added tax. Okay, vat's a French word. It means big government. The VAT is what they want because Obama knows and Obama's team knows that they've taken the income tax as far as they can go. They cannot fund a, a European-sized welfare state with just the one tapeworm. They need a second tapeworm. They need a VAT. They don't think they can sell us the VAT right away, so they want to sell us a carbon tax, which is a VAT on only the things that energy is involved in, like everything and then they'll bring it up. Okay, so watch for those. Third, temporary taxes. Temporary taxes aren't temporary. Most taxes are introduced on the promise that they will be temporary. Folks, the next few years is all about stopping any tax increase and keeping the sequester. The sequester is a spending limit with teeth Now, I don't want to go out on a limb here, but I think Obama will do anything to get us to remove, delay, or reduce the sequester. He is the kind of guy who could take the FAA and have them not show up for work in order to scare everybody in the country. I mean, I'm not saying he'd really do this, but it's the sort of thing that he might do. He might cancel the Easter egg hunt to be annoying to small children. He might cancel trips to the White House, which are all run by volunteers. I mean, he makes a list of the things we think we need the federal government for, and then he wants to reduce spending on that. The Republicans in Congress have again and again said, we'll give you flexibility. The dollar amount can't change. We're not letting you spend a dollar more than you're allowed, but you want to move a dollar from here to there, that's fine. He is opposed 
every one of those efforts because he wants the sequester to fail. It's not going to. And he also doesn't want to be responsible for governing. So step one, we got four years of hold the sequester. It's not exciting, but it's pretty easy to understand. Even politicians in Washington on our team can get this one. No sequester changes that weaken it. You want to reform it? A dollar here, up a dollar there, same dollar amount? Fine. Nothing that delays it, no tax increase. And then we need to win the Senate. And Congresswoman Bachman's point was exactly correct. Obama's first term lasted two years. When the Republicans took the House, he couldn't do anything interesting, re-damaging anymore. Now he wants to go back to the fun days he had in those first two years. And he will undo the sequester. Constitutionally, I'm not the sequester, we will undo the sequester with the votes, but he'll undo the filibuster. So we can't count on the 60 vote requirement to protect us in the Senate. The bulwark is keeping the House majority and taking the Senate back. <laughs> then, in four years, we need to win the presidency. We have a collection of governors who have governed well and long and are battle-tested. We have a number of senators who are doing very interesting things. We could field five, ten guys, ladies, all of whom we could be proud of and would crush the other team. And I want all of them to compete for our affections and to amaze us with dramatic changes at the state level and at the national level so that we can have the best and the toughest of them as our candidate for president in four years. So, but that's the next four years, which is basically hold the line, stop Obama from doing any more permanent damage. While we work on that, we have an opportunity. And that is, there are at least 57 states, I'm told. In those states, 25 have a Republican governor and a Republican House and Senate. 25. Living in those 25 states, I'm sorry, we're not in one right now. Newsflash. In those 25 states, 165 million Americans live. A majority of Americans today, after the Republican Party ceased to exist last November, according to the New York Times, a majority of Americans live in states with a Republican governor, Republican House, and Senate. Today, there are 13 states, and we're in one. Two weeks ago, I spoke to a similar group of taxpayer activists in Boston. They're also one of the 13. You know them, California, Illinois, Minnesota, Maryland, Massachusetts. 13 states with 81 million people in them, a quarter of the country, live under D's. And this is where we show America what works and what doesn't. In those states that are raising taxes, and here in Minnesota they want to raise income taxes and sales taxes and taxes on beer, wine, and spirits and cigarettes and just a list goes on. I asked somebody for one pager on the list of tax increases. They said the font would be too small. It goes more than one page. California, they've raised income taxes and sales taxes. Illinois, income taxes and sales taxes. New York, income taxes, sales taxes. Massachusetts, Maryland. All to avoid governing. All to avoid reforming the gold-plated pension systems. All to avoid reforming the size and cost of government. So the blue states, with Democratic governors and houses and Senate, this needs to be, as I understand, I'm told and promised that this gets changed in two years in at least the House of Representatives here in Minnesota. And that's key to stopping this. But those states can turn themselves into California or Greece simply with Democrat votes. Now in 25 states, we're talking large states, Texas, Wisconsin, which is nearby. Watch Wisconsin, learn from Wisconsin, be like Wisconsin. Talk to the nice governor. Ask him to check out what governing looks like compared to what he's doing. But in the, in the red states, we've passed right to work in two of them. We've been passing concealed carry laws and strengthening them state by state by state. 
We pass scholarships, vouchers, whatever you want to call them, for 500,000 kids in Indiana. 380,000 kids in Louisiana, and somewhere between two and 300,000 in Arizona. The public school monopoly is losing its control. They're planning to phase out the state income tax in Kansas, in Louisiana, in North Carolina. They're cutting income taxes in Ohio and Wisconsin and in Oklahoma and around the country. The red states are moving in the right direction and right now the blue states are moving in the wrong direction and we are having a national referendum on what works and what doesn't work. Now, let me end with one thought. No one's life is a complete waste. Some people serve as bad examples. No state is a complete waste. Some of them serve as bad examples. Let us work here to make sure that that's California and Illinois and not Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a, uh, we have a coffee mug for uh, Mr. Norquist, another good guy with a gun. A great American, a great patriot, Grover Norquist, thank you very much. Let's give him another hand.